Thank you for joining us. Uh, we are recording this interview with Dr. Marty Cooper, formerly of Motorola, um, who is a pioneer in the wireless communications industry, especially in radio spectrum management. He has 11 patents in the field. I'm joined by John Fasella, the former president of the Radio Club of America. My name is David Bart. I am the current president of the Radio Club of America. And over the next little while, we hope to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the first public mobile phone call made in New York City on April 3rd, 1973. Dr. Cooper is considered the father of the handheld cell phone. He is the first person in history to make a handheld cellular phone call in public on that date in 1973. He's also co-founder and current chairman of Dyna LLC, and he was the founder and CEO of ArrayCom. He is the recipient of numerous awards for his achievements in wireless technology, um, in, he received the Marconi Prize in 2013. So with that, congratulations, Dr. Cooper, on the 50th anniversary of your historic achievement. What does that anniversary mean to you? Well, first of all, Dave, you could call me Marty. We've known each other long enough, so we don't have to be formal. Uh, the, uh, the 50th anniversary, uh, you'll be surprised uh, at my viewpoint, uh, but for the past 50 years, we've been in the game stage of cellular technology. We've been experimenting, uh, we've got uh, 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 incredible uh, uh, technology uh, into our cell phones, into the networks, uh, but we're still experimenting. We're still trying out to do things. The industry is really just starting. The real impact in society of the cellular phone, of cellular technology is just starting, Dave. Uh, and John, by the way. Thank you for uh, for uh, uh, being on this with us, John. So uh, I really look forward to it, and I hope we get to talk about that a little bit in this uh, session about what the cell phone uh, is really going to do for us in, in the future. Some of our viewers may be unfamiliar with that original Dynatech phone. Can you hold it up and show yes. us? I what it looked like and, and how you operated it on that day. You can maybe give us a little sense of how heavy it is. And yeah, uh, Let's see if I can. Uh, th this is a, 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 a exact model of a phone. It looks bigger because, because it's uh, closer to you on the screen, but you can get a feel for uh, how big it is. It weighed uh, uh, a kilo, over two pounds. Uh, it uh, had a battery life of uh, 25 minutes of, of uh, talking. And that wasn't a problem, uh, Dave and John, because you couldn't hold this thing up for 25 minutes. It was so heavy. <laughs> it, it really is about the size of a brick. It's, it's been <laughs> nicknamed the brick over the years, but it really is about the size and weight of a brick. Yeah, it, it is. Uh, it, it was, for that time, an, an incredible achievement uh, because uh, 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 both of you are old enough to know what a cell phone uh, looked like, uh, what it was a car phone, and what two-way radios look like. Uh, and this phone incorporates everything that a two-way radio does, uh, plus it talks and uh, listens. It was a new frequency band, 900 megahertz. Uh, it had, uh, do you recall what two-way radios were? We had uh, maybe up to six channels, right? And this thing had 450 channels uh, available to it. Modern cell phone, as you know, have many thousands of, of uh, channels available. So for its time, it was a, a great achievement, uh, but uh, it's also a reflection of what primitive times 1973 was. The, uh, there were no, the internet had yet, not yet been uh, uh, made available. Uh, there were no digital cameras. Uh, there were no uh, uh, integrated circuits. So uh, uh, the uh, idea that you could actually make a handheld phone with wired components uh, was an incredible achievement for uh, my team at Motorola. And the magic of this is that it tapped directly into the phone circuits of the world. It wasn't just a radio. 
with a push to talk operation and a very confined radius. Um, so you really invented an entire system where the phone could talk to a relay who would then connect into the telephone circuits. Well, that's right, uh, uh, Dave. Uh, uh, the afternoon of that first phone call, uh, we did a, a press conference and we asked the uh, uh, members of the press whether anybody wanted to make a call themselves. Uh, and this uh, one lady got up and said, I'd like to call my family uh, in Australia. And I said, of course, that will work. And of course, she was under the impression this phone that was talking from that room in the uh, downtown Hilton uh, all the way to Australia. And of course, we knew that it was talking to the building across the street. The rest of the way was on, a, on the public network. John? Yeah. So, <clears throat> Marty, I, I just want to give a plug for your book, Cutting the Cord. I have read it from cover to cover, and it's a fascinating story that you've recorded. Um, I joined Motorola actually in 73, but a little bit after the cell phone was announced. And um, I think uh, the book does a lot of justice to the difficulty in coming up with a revolutionary invention like you did at the time. It's, uh, the book is called Cutting the Cord. And uh, well, I've got the book open. I want to see if I can show you. Uh, when we uh, created the first phone, uh, I assembled the top designers uh, at Motorola. Uh, uh, none of them worked for me. They, uh, they worked for the division uh, as a whole. I ran a, a subdivision of Motorola at the time. Uh, but uh, they were so excited about this project, they just stopped uh, all their other work. They didn't stop charging other people for their time, but they they stopped all their work so they could work on this project. And uh, see, let's see if you can... People in 1973, there was no such thing as a cell phone. And they actually invented a slider phone, a, a flip phone, a curved phone, a lozenge phone. They gave me the choice of, of having this phone in any configuration you can imagine. Really creative people. And we ended up selecting uh, this very simple block, the brick. Uh, and the reason was obvious. We wanted to be as simple as it could be. Because, as you know, whenever you want to demonstrate something, if something can go wrong, it will go wrong. And so we wanted to minimize the possibilities of, of a failure. So uh, uh, the uh, the team that did that was incredible. And we assembled the uh, top uh, circuit designers and, and uh, circuit developers at Motorola. There were uh, 22 people on the team. But we also embraced technology from all over the company. And we went to the semiconductor division and got a, a, a processor chip that had not yet been fully developed. And they let us use that chip so we could use it for the frequency synthesizer. And we went to our uh, antenna group and they created a 900 megahertz uh, antenna that would work uh, on, on a handheld unit. Uh, we the uh, duplexer was a major challenge. The duplexer in a in the uh, car phones that existed at that time that were bigger than your fist. Uh, there was no way you could put a duplexer like that into a phone like this. They actually made a tiny miniature uh, duplexer, which ended up working. So uh, the, uh, the the idea that you could build a uh, cell phone at that time that was an incredible achievement to do it in three months which is the amount of time that we uh, gave our team that was an absolutely incredible achievement and the guy that ran the uh, program that actually constructed the phone uh, was Don Linder uh, Don when I approached Don to do this he said uh, I don't think that's possible. Uh, I don't think it'll be done. I'll try. And I uh, gave him a big hug and said, Don, I know you can do it. I guess what he did. Well, that's fantastic. By the way, I'll just add uh, to what you said, Marty, that in my experience at Moto, um, a, product, a new product took one to two years to develop. So that gives the audience some feel for the three months versus 24. So since that time, what are some of the most important 
changes in wireless communications um, since that time when you walked across um, Sixth Avenue. Can you summarize those? Well, uh, of course, the biggest thing that happened, uh, as you know, uh, not a lot of people believe me when I told them that uh, someday everybody would have a cell phone. And we're almost there, John. And we, uh, in, uh, there are more than half the people in the world, maybe almost two thirds of the people in the world uh, actually use cell phones. The number of subscriptions of cell phones is more than the population of Earth. So uh, that, I don't think there's ever been an invention uh, that has uh, achieved that kind of penetration in such a short time. Uh, the, uh, we in the U.S. don't really uh, use the phones uh, in as important ways as happens in uh, the undeveloped countries. And there are uh, people on Earth uh, who uh, are sustaining themselves only because of their cell phone. A, a, a billion people have moved out of severe poverty. They're still poor, but uh, they've moved out of severe poverty uh, over the last uh, 20, 25 years, largely because the cell phone's been available to them. So uh, the uh, impact of the cell phone in that regard has been uh, quite remarkable. Uh, but as I mentioned before, we're just just beginning, the uh, impact of the cell phone in the future uh, is going to be uh, 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 unbelievable. Uh, let me let me uh, just uh, uh, reflect on what I think is going to happen uh, in the next twenty years: the cell phone revolution. There, there are three areas that I've been focused on because they are mostly of interest to me. Now, first of all is education. Uh, our educational system, for the most part, is way behind. We're just starting to catch up. But imagine a teacher now lecturing to students, each of whom has access to all the knowledge of the world because they got a cell phone, the cell phone can reach out to, to the internet. So having a teacher give information to a student no longer has any significance. Uh, and uh, and, uh, Dave and John, I know, I know you're both uh, conversant with what's going on with artificial intelligence now, uh, with chat GTP. Uh, so uh, not only can the cell phone access information, uh, you can actually write an essay for your teacher without ever doing, uh, creating anything. So the whole concept of education, of teaching is going to change, and it's going to change for the better. Uh, our students will uh, understand how to discriminate between useful information and fake information. Uh, they will learn how uh, to use artificial intelligence as an aid, uh, but they will still have to do the creativity. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind that our children are going to be smarter than we are, and their children are going to be even smarter than that. Uh, and boy, can we use that intelligence. If you look at the problems of the world today, uh, the fact that we have poverty at all, uh, the fact that there are wars going on, people being killed for no reason at all, uh, somehow uh, we ought to have the intelligence to solve those problems, uh, and I'm convinced that that will happen. The second area that I think uh, is extraordinarily important is in healthcare. Uh, you know, we have a concept uh, called the uh, uh, annual examination. I'll, I'll bet both of you have the animal examination, don't you, David? Uh, absolutely worthless. Uh, why is it worthless? Uh, because uh, diseases don't wait until uh, you have the examination. They happen uh, at whatever random time it occurs. And here you've got this cell phone that's now really an extension of your personality. You carry it with you all the time. Uh, you've got, uh, uh, you've got uh, uh, apps on it that reflect what you need in the world. Uh, and uh, why not have that cell phone monitor your physical attributes all the time? Why not have a physical examination every 30 seconds? So if you have a, a heart attack come on, uh, you will know about that before it happens. You, you will anticipate it. You will pop a pill. Uh, uh, call up the doctor and find out what to do. 
uh, you will avoid that heart attack. Uh, and uh, that concept will ultimately apply to every disease. There, there's no reason why we can't have a sensor on our body that's looking for cancer cells. If you think about it, uh, all of us, every single person has cancer cells in their body, but your immune system takes care of those things. Uh, and the only time you have the disease of cancer is when your immune system loses control. Why can't we have a sensor that anticipates that loss of control? And when that happens, and we go to see uh, a doctor, this is a doctor of the future, of course, uh, and zap those out of control cancer cells. I see a future, gonna take a few generations, but there is a future where there is no disease. And the main aspect of that, the thing that causes that uh, future of, of no disease is the ability to connect people. And so you uh, end up with a what is the, really the most important contribution of the cell phone to humanity, uh, and that is the ability to collaborate. The, the ability for people to talk to each other, to uh, resolve conflicts, uh, and to create. Just think about uh, the, the idea of creation. Uh, I, always, I think about uh, Albert Einstein uh, coming up with the idea of relativity. Uh, it's undeveloped, but he writes it all down, uh, sends a copy of this to his buddy, uh, Niels Bohr. Of course, the mail takes two weeks at, the, at that time. Uh, Niels Bohr uh, spends a month or two thinking about it and writes a letter back uh, to Albert Einstein with some suggestions about how to improve it. Well, just think about what happens today. We pick up our cell phone. I call up Dave and say, Dave, I got this great idea. What do you think about it? Dave says, well, not a bad idea, but you haven't thought of so-and-so. So the whole concept of collaboration is going to change. Uh, we are going to see, we've already started to see, an acceleration in our ability to create uh, new technology. The world is changing by the day. Uh, for the most part, it's changing for the better. Uh, and uh, that's not going to stop. It's actually accelerating. All of this was really possible because you pulled the phone away from the wall. You mm -hmm. changed the paradigm. The paradigm was that the phone called you at a place and the phone was in a geographic spot. Even the phone exchanges were set up by geographic location. Now you're anywhere. And that the, the power of that can be seen in your comments of how the third world has really developed independent of the old landline networks. They have moved right into a modern cellular wireless environment. That's right, Dave. Most of the people in the world have actually bypassed the wired phone uh, and are using uh, uh, cell phones. Uh, I have to add to what you're saying is the whole concept of what a phone call is has changed. Just think about it in the old days with a wired phone, when you made a phone call, you were calling a place. Today, when you make a phone call, you expect a person to answer, right? And that's a profound difference. It is, absolutely. So, Marty, just changing direction a wee bit, um, in your view, were there any surprises, uh, particular successes or disappointments during the development of the cell phone um, uh, from the beginning and, and in the past 50 years? Well, I get surprised all the time. Uh, one of the things I'm surprised about is the, the dumb things that we do, uh, like uh, uh, make a cell phone uh, with an interface. Uh, dumb things that we have done is we have been overtaken by the technologies to the extent we've forgotten that the purpose of a cell phone is to make people's lives more convenient, easier. And here I've got my cell phone uh, which is a, a, a block of flat plastic. I put it up to my round head. Uh, I have uh, applications. They say the applications are, are going to uh, customize the phone to me. All I have to do to customize this phone is to sort out uh, among 2 million apps, 
which ones are the ones that are going to suit me? That, that doesn't make any sense at all to me. So uh, uh, I have a, a vision of what the cell phone of the future ought to look like. Uh, it, it, it is kind of ridiculous calling this a phone in the first place, isn't it? Uh, the phone is, is one of the uh, minor capabilities of this device. Uh, but the phone of the future will incorporate artificial intelligence, uh, and that artificial intelligence will be yours. It will be Dave's and John's, and not something that some engineer in a laboratory figured out. It will, the artificial intelligence will understand your needs and will, when you need to do something, the phone will either create an app to do that, or it will search out and find the uh, correct app, and you won't even have to think about it. To me, that is a real uh, uh, device that serves humanity. So uh, one of the things that uh, has become obvious to me that, uh, is that technology is the application of science to create products and services that make people's lives better. Sometimes we technologists kind of lose sight of that. Mm. We get so entranced by the gadgetry, the ability to put a supercomputer uh, into a small phone, and we forget what the purpose of this phone is to make people's lives better. So I'm hoping that uh, in the next generation, in the future, in the next 50 years, uh, we will embrace that idea uh, and work very hard to make people's lives better, to enhance their lives, uh, to make them happier, uh, to make them more productive. Uh, and I think that the process has already started and that it's going to accelerate in the coming years. That makes perfect sense, Marty. So knowing what you know now and how things did develop, is there anything you would have done differently in developing and working with wireless devices and systems? Well, uh, that brings up a whole new subject, John, and I appreciate your asking that. Uh, you know, one of the important things in my career uh, working in the two-way radio business was uh, Spectrum. Uh, there is a uh, myth that there is a limited amount of spectrum. I don't believe that. Uh, I, in, in fact, incorporated that into a what I call the law of spectrum capacity, which says that the capacity, the ability to put information through all of the useful radio spectrum has doubled every 30 months for the past 120 years since uh, Marconi first commercialized radio. So, uh, and if you uh, are quick, uh, quick in mathematics, you can figure out that that's from Marconi's time to ours a 10 trillion times increase in capacity. There's, uh, we know enough about technology today to know that we can do this for at least another 50 years. And you know that we're going to come up with new technologies in the next 50, uh, 50 years and keep expanding that, that capacity. And we're going to have to do that because the number of applications uh, and the amount of bandwidth that's required to do these things that I talked about before, to do um, uh, to uh, eliminate disease, to modernize education, are going to require huge amounts of, of bandwidth. We're going to be looking at 3D pictures. Uh, we're going to be uh, uh, looking at x-rays. So the amount of bandwidth is going to have to keep increasing. Uh, the tools to do that, uh, are, as an example, we've, we've already gone through the issue of expanding the radio spectrum. We were, uh, people now talking about terahertz, uh, but we haven't e even started to use these tools at the lower frequencies. And one example of that is uh, smart antennas. Uh, with uh, uh, smart antennas, uh, we can uh, multiply the capacity of any specific frequency band. Today, with technology we have today, by 10 or 20 times in the future, much more than that. Uh, and yet our carriers are not focused on doing that, on expanding the capacity of the lower frequencies. Uh, they're into a, a new thing called millimeter wave. 
and if they're not satisfied with millimeter wave, and they're going up to terahertz frequencies. Well, if you think about it, the uh, range of a terahertz space station uh, is a couple of feet. That, that doesn't appear to be very useful to me, except for the Internet of Things. And uh, my view is, yes, it, the Internet of Things is important. And the ability of, of the cell phone technology uh, to run factories, uh, to manage uh, uh, electrical networks uh, is uh, really important for the future. But shouldn't we, while we're working on the Internet of Things, shouldn't be working shouldn't we be working on the internet of people <laughs> we are not doing that half the people in the uh, world today do not have access to the internet for education it's either because they can't afford it or uh, because there's no coverage shouldn't we be putting as much effort onto cost and coverage as, as we are uh, to putting up a uh, millimeter wave uh, base stations. So uh, I think, uh, I hope I haven't gone too far away from your question, uh, John, uh, but I think there's a, a miss uh, that we are not prioritizing uh, the things uh, that are people oriented, and, and I hope that changes in the future. I think um, that's a very astute observation, Marty, and I think you just, in, in this moment, coined a new term, Internet of People. So uh, let everybody remember that in this conversation, because it's a, a very interesting idea, and I'm thinking about it. So talking about people, um, some critics, not, not all by any means, but, but a few critics have said that the cell phone has disrupted the attention span of workers and students and also enabled a lot of misinformation via social media. What, what do you think? Of course, you know, any new technology uh, carries with it uh, uh, dangerous concerns. Uh, so let's, uh, let's focus on addiction and, and uh, think about what happened uh, when TV came on. Do you remember that? John, oh, yes. You know, people, the kids would get locked out of their television and said, do nothing but watch television all the time. I hope you noticed that we survived and we <laughs> learned how to manage that. We learned how to get our kids uh, to uh, uh, do their homework and watch television at the same time. So I think the same thing is true with the cell phone. We're going through some the difficult periods now. Uh, uh, you know, the cell phone is being used for crime, as, uh, as a matter of fact. Uh, it's being used for pornography. Well, we, uh, somehow, I just have a, a deep feeling for humanity. That humanity gets over these problems. We survive these problems. We figure out how to handle them. And, and somehow or other, we're, we're going to have to work on them. We're still in early stages, 50 years, as I keep repeating, uh, is only the beginning. Uh, we are going to solve those problems. We are going to solve the addiction problem. We're going to solve the uh, spectrum problem. Uh, we're going to somehow or other uh, come up uh, with a way of providing a separate internet for our children for education uh, that uh, doesn't expose them to uh, pornography or, or other things that focuses on uh, education. Don't you think education is, is as important as everything else we have? Uh, believe it or not, there is a separate internet for medicine, they call it Lexus, that, that is focused on uh, medical advances, uh, medical technology. Why not have a internet for uh, youngsters? And I, I uh, can imagine that you might have a totally separate uh, internet uh, for elementary school, another one for high school, uh, and another one for uh, uh, the, for the rest of us. So uh, there is just so much that can be done to make the uh, these problems that people are concerned about: uh, addiction, uh, uh, fake news. Uh, there they are problems that have to be solved, but they're solvable. You paint, a, you paint a very positive and hopeful view of the future. 
And some of the challenges you've identified are probably more societal, behavioral, political. But what do you think some of the challenges are on the technology side that need to be overcome in realizing the broader application of wireless technology for the benefit of all? Well, I can talk about some of the minor problems that uh, I think are, that uh, uh, already have solutions that we are aware of. Uh, there's the idea, for example, that you have to keep charging this phone uh, every day, and uh, if you talk a lot, you go run out of charge. Uh, and yet, uh, think about what the human body is. Uh, we are a charger. We ingest food, and we convert that food to energy. Isn't that what a charging system does? So uh, I think that the uh, what we call call a cell phone today ultimately uh, is going to be I mean it's already a part of us it's going to be embedded under our skin and why not use the human body as the as the charging as the energy source for your uh, so-called cell phone you know what you guys are convincing me of is we need a new name for this device that I haven't figured it out yet. In the world today, we call it a cell phone, and uh, more accurately, in a number of countries, they call it a mobile phone. Uh, in uh, other countries, uh, they have uh, other names for it. So I hope we come up with a, a, a more reflected. The reason we call this a cell phone, by the way, is that uh, Bell Labs uh, originally came up with the idea. Uh, and as wonderful as Bell Labs were, they were a bunch of techies. I think a marketing guy would have come up with them a better name for a cell phone. So that get me back on track. What, 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 what were we addressing? You said something we, really... We were talking about some of the challenges maybe on the technology oh, side yeah. yes. that, that need it. to be overcome to expand the, the, the functionality of the device in, in whatever yeah. form that future device may be in. Absolutely, Dave. Well, I've already uh, addressed the issue uh, of uh, the the uh, need for having an artificial intelligence in the, in the cell phone that optimizes the cell phone for you. You are the person, the cell phone is an extension of your personality, not the personality of the guy that designed the uh, cell phone. But in the medical field, we, in order to conquer disease, we are going to have to come up with all kinds of sensors and these sensors have to be put in your body uh, based upon your DNA, uh, your susceptibility uh, to specific diseases. Uh, and that concept, the idea of having uh, uh, sensors that anticipate disease rather than waiting for you to get sick uh, so we can cure the disease, and those sensors were just in the primitive stages. Uh, ultimately, they also have to be embedded in your body uh, and they have to be connected to some central uh, server. Uh, and that uh, to me is what the cell phone of the future is going to look like. Uh, everybody is going to carry a server on them that connects them to the rest of the world. Uh, but uh, on their body, they will have uh, various devices. Uh, I think ultimately they're all going to be embedded uh, that uh, uh, customize the function, that optimize the function. So I, I want to describe to you the optimum telephone. We still do use the telephone, don't we? And the optimum telephone, I think, is going to end up being, uh, is going to start out being like an earring or uh, something in your ear, uh, but ultimately it'll, it'll be embedded under your skin uh, near your uh, ear because we want to get uh, the ability that they have this phone both hear what you're saying and have you hear what comes on the phone. Uh, the, uh, this uh, device under your skin will have a, a supercomputer uh, in it. And if I want to talk to Dave, uh, I will say, well, give me Dave on the phone. They say, which Dave do you want? Do you want your cousin Dave in Pittsburgh or uh, Dave Bart uh, from the uh, RCA? And I'll say, uh, Dave Bart, of course. And next thing you know, I'm talking to you, Dave. So uh, to me, that is uh, the uh, telephone uh, of the future. It's an optimized telephone. Uh, and uh, all of the other functions uh, of the phone sooner or later have to be optimized. 
So instead of looking at this tiny screen, uh, we will have uh, uh, at the beginning glasses that will wear. Uh, ultimately, I know what uh, it's going to sound like. Uh, I, I'm uh, trying to turn, turn us out in, into uh, Borgs. Uh, but uh, why not replace the lenses in their eyes with electronic uh, lenses that, that let us do uh, virtual reality while we're, we're uh, living in the real world? So uh, all of those things uh, are going to take generations to happen, uh, but uh, they are going to happen unless uh, we get out of control and blow ourselves up. Uh, but as you said, Dave, I'm an optimist. I don't think that. Well, this has been a wonderful view of the past, the celebration of the past and a view of the future. Um, John, do you have any any thoughts or comments as we get as we wrap up? No, I, I always enjoy listening to Marty um, because he is, uh, if anything, a futurist. And, and he sees far into the distant future and imagines things like the Internet of People that I would not have thought of for sure. To Marty, as we, as we head um, to the end here and celebrate your anniversary, do you have any closing thoughts of your own? Uh, I do have a closing thought, Dave. Uh, I think the biggest thing that the cell phone epitomizes is the one of opportunity. You know, I've just been so lucky in my life that I just have to be in the right place. I, I, I'm not exceptional in any way. I just happen to be in the right place where some ideas that I had, uh, and, and I had uh, an environment, and I had colleagues who were incredible. The management of Motorola were, were uh, amazing to take a a wild man like me and, and let me uh, execute ideas that nobody else thought were uh, useful. What the cell phone epitomizes to me is a future of opportunity. There is no reason now why all of our children can't have the opportunity to create, to, create, uh, to make the world better, uh, whether they're engineers or humanists or uh, whatever they do. Uh, I think we uh, have the potential of a much better world, no disease, no warfare, smarter people, uh, no poverty. And so uh, this is the future that I look for. Uh, and I'm so proud that I made a very tiny contribution uh, to that future. And I'm very proud of you, Dave and John, for giving me the opportunity yeah, for the last uh, 15, 20 minutes. Thank you very much. Well, Marty, it's our distinct pleasure to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the first mobile cell phone call with you. Congratulations to you and everyone who contributed to that wonderful demonstration of a new invention that's changed humanity um, in 1973. And uh, that's it for us from the Radio Club of America. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed this discussion with uh, Dr. Marty Cooper and we wish everyone the best. Well, I'm, I'm incapable of knowing what I sound like, so, so <laughs> you sound I, hope great. You can, I hope <laughs> you can clean me up, uh, David John, but you guys did a, just a great job, and, and I'm, uh, uh, you know, I still have a warm spot in my heart for the uh, radio club. I've had all ups and downs with the, with the radio club, but I uh, always thought it was a great organization, and uh, thank you so much for perpetuating it, and and, uh, and improving it. <laughs>